Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jogra 66, Hour of the Truth. I'm glad that I found the time to come to the table today to do another recording of the book from Edmund Peretz, The Secret History of the Jesuits. It's been nagging on me to do that for a while, but I have had so many computer problems and this morning even my new bought computer, the disk crashed completely doesn't do anything anymore and that's, that thing is only six weeks old. I didn't buy it officially. And I don't hear that guy anymore. And yeah, and then I have another quote-unquote friend in this system who wanted to replace that disk with an SSD or what's that called, you know, these new disks. And uh, I SMSed, I texted him on the cell phone. I left a voicemail, I sent an email and I got no reaction. This is how it is when you have to rely on people in this um, in this r real antichrist world. It's not so funny, so I am doing this recording now with my laptop. I even was able to find a cable to connect my big screen to the laptop and therefore make it fit for readings because on the normal screen of the laptop it would have been not possible to read and in the next in the uh, next to that have a picture as I always have you know um, but now I have this big screen that I have for my uh, from my PC normally and I adjusted it this way also in the camera that it will be looking fine and I just hope that um, we can come together right now and uh, do a uh, reading of uh, the secret history of the Jesuits. So, therefore, let us see what we have prepared here. This is the PDF and we left off last time on page 162. Uh, last time for the last recording was 11th of February. Today it's the 26th, so only a fortnight, but I have been do doing about, I think, 20 recordings with Brett on Cold World Babylon in the meantime. Overwhelmed him a little bit. I hope he's okay right now. And uh, now we are going to continue the infernal cycle in chapter 5 of The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris called The Gestapo and the Company of Jesus. The Gestapo is short for Geheime Staatspolizei, means Secret State Police. Okay? If Pius XI and Pius XII, both Antichrists by the way, goodwill and friendliness never failed towards the Führer, whom they had brought to power, we must admit that he fulfilled all the conditions of the pact by which he was bound to the Vatican. As he had expressly promised to strangle the anti-clericals, they soon followed the liberals and Jews into the concentration camps. We know how the chief of the Third Reich had decided the fate of the Jews. They were simply massacred, or when more advantages, made to work until worn out and then liquidated. In this case the final solution was only delayed. But let us see first how an especially authorized personality, Franco, Francisco Franco, the fascist leader of Spain, Knight of the Order of Christ, expressed confirmed, expressly confirmed the collusion between the Vatican and the Nazis. According to Reform, and um, this is what the press of the Spanish dictator published on the 3rd of May in 1945, the day of Hitler's death. Now, this is very, very important that you understand this. In my last or last but one reading with Cold World Babylon with Brett, we also went through this. This is an official publishing. Yeah? And I'm going to read this, um, this little quote from uh, Reform twice. Okay? So I will read it r once to you the way that it is stated here that you can follow and after that I will read it to you in the way that it is actually to be understood. Okay? So we read here and I just highlighted the screen so that you can have a good look and read along. Reform uh, according to Reform, this is, uh, this is the French magazine Reform, this is what the press of the Spanish dictator published on the 3rd of May, the day of Hitler's death in 1945. Quote, Adolf Hitler, 
son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity. It is therefore understandable that words cannot be found to lament over his death, when so many were found to exalt his life. Over his mortal remains stands his victorious moral figure. With the palm of the martyr, God gives Hitler the laurels of victory." Unquote. This is how the Roman Catholic Church stands besides Hitler and stands behind Hitler, stood behind Hitler and still does so today. Now this is the way that it of course appeared in the newspaper and now I'm going to read it to you in a second, just checking the uh, recording here. Now I am reading it to you in the way that it should be understood. Listen close. Adolf Hitler, son of the synagogue of Satan, died while defending Roman Catholicism. It is therefore understandable that words cannot be found to lament over his death, when so many were found to exalt his life. Over his mortal remains stands his victorious moral figure. With the palm of the martyr, Satan gives Hitler the laurels of victory." Unquote. This is how it is supposed to read. Adolf Hitler, son of the synagogue of Satan, died while defending Roman Catholicism. With the palm of the martyr, Satan gives Hitler the laurels of victory, is the main sentence of this quote. And I think it is quite important that you understand why I read it like this and why it has to be understood like this. Okay? But let's continue. You can do your own studies on this. This was published in Reform the 21st of July 1945 and uh, just for the information for you um, I think we already did a uh, picture search on that on Reform before. No? Oh, no, no, I don't have that. But anyway, then probably I couldn't get a picture of that in the internet, that's possible. Now, the author continues, this funeral oration of the Nazi chief, a challenge to the victorious allies, is voiced by the Holy See itself under the cover of Franco's press. It is a communique of the Vatican given via Madrid. Of course, this missing hero will deserve, well deserve the gratitude of the Roman Church, and they do not attempt to conceal it. He served her faithfully. All those this Church pointed out to him was her adversaries felt the consequences. And this good son wasn't slow in admitting what he owed to his most holy mother, especially to those who made themselves her soldiers in the world. Quote, I learned much from the order of the Jesuits, said Hitler, until now there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Roman Catholic Church. I transferred much of this organization into my own party. I'm going to let you on in a secret. I am founding an order, and my works like the Welfenberg, for example, in my Burks of the Order, I will raise up a youth which will make the world tremble. Hitler then stopped, saying that he couldn't say any more. A Burg is the German word Burg for castle. And there were different castles, like for example the Welfen castle, where things like those happened. Another highly placed Hitlerian, Walter Schellenberg, who was the former chief of the German counter espionage, completed this confidence from the Führer after the war. Quote, the SS organization, that is the Schutzstaffel, the SS organization had been constituted by Heinrich Himmler, according to the principles of the Jesuits' order. Their regulations and the spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius of Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly. The, ex, uh, the Reichsführer SS, which is Himmler's title as Supreme Chief of the SS, was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits' general, 
and the whole structure of the direction was a close imitation of the Catholic Church's hierarchical order. A medieval castle near Paderborn in Westphalia and called the Webelsberg, that's the one that I just uh, meant here with the castle in his burgs, in Hitler's quote, the Webelsberg was restored. It, be uh, it became what would be called a SS monastery. Unquote. For their part, the best theological pens were busy demonstrating the similarity between the Catholic and Nazi doctrines. And for that work, the sons of Loyola were the busiest. As an example, let us see how Michael Schmaus, Jesuit theologian, presented to the public a series of studies on this subject. Empire and Church is a series of writings which should help the building up of the Third Reich as it unites a National Socialist state to Catholic Christianity. The National Socialist movement is the most vigorous and massive protest against, that, against the spirit of the 19th and 20th centuries, you know, when people were liberated. A compromise between the Catholic faith and liberal thinking is impossible. Yeah, a compromise between the uh, Catholic faith and liberal thinking is impossible. It should be the same with you that you should not make any compromises with the Bible. There is no compromise possible with the Bible and the Catholic faith, for example, with even liberals, for example, with anything worldly. There is just no compromise possible. Nothing is more contrary to Catholicism than democracy. Why? Because Catholicism is ultramontane. It accepts the absolute ruling of the Pope, the ultramontane ruler, the king of the church and his state. And democracy is just the opposite. It is a rule by the people. Yeah? It is a rule from the bottom up and not from the top down, as is Catholicism. The reawakened meaning of strict authority opens up again in the way to the real interpretation of ecclesiastical authority. The mistrust of liberty is founded on the Catholic doctrine of original sin. Yeah, the mistrust of liberty is founded on the Catholic doctrine of original sin. Very important sentence this is. Why? Because original sin is a Roman Catholic doctrine. There is no original sin. The Bible never speaks of an original sin. The Bible speaks of that everybody is born in trespasses and sins, but it does not speak of original sin. That is a distinction from the Roman Catholic Church. Now it continues here, the National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim. Bang! What? The National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same same aim? So that means that you can actually use National Socialist as an equivalent for the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. And I think we already read this quote from Civilta Cattolica, didn't we? Let's see if I have this here on my computer. You know, I have a lot of things to still find here. I don't know if I still have it here. Um, I have the text. But I don't know if, if that text, of course, is uh, up to date in that way. Let's just look. Uh, Civilta. And then I should have... Ah, okay, it is here. Civilta Cattolica, which is the house organ of the Jesuits. It says, Fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. You see this? Yeah? That is exactly the same what uh, it is said here um, in the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. And this quote is taken from Begegnungen zwischen katholischem Christentum und nationalsozialistischer Weltanschauung by Dr. Michele, uh, by Michele Schmaus, professor at the Faculty of Theology in Munich. 
Therefore, you have to know that the faculty or, 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 or the the, uh, the university of Munich is the quote unquote successor of the university you know as Ingolstadt, where Adam Weishaupt at the time founded the Illuminati. Yeah? So it's a Jesuit-controlled university, and this Michael Schmaus writes this book. Begegnungen zwischen katholischem Christentum und nationalsozialistischer Weltanschauung, which means in English um, meetings or acquaintances, but meetings between uh, Catholic Christendom and national socialist dogmas. Yeah, that's what this book means in English, published in 1933, by the way. And it says the National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim. That is what this Michael Schmaus, at a professor at the Jesuit University of Munich, writes in 1933, and Civilta Catholica at a later time says the fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Do you see how those things never speak against each other? Do you see how important your doing your own research is? When you read a book like this and you have these other quotes, you see how they all come together and they all say the same. But when you are lost in the world of research in the quote-unquote alternative media, and with that I mean sources like David Icke, Maxwell, uh, John Maxwell, um, Tom, uh, what's what's he what's what's he called there? Um, uh, Alex Jones. Um, uh, these guys, when you when you go and quote unquote research what they tell you, they often contradict each other. They never say the same because they all have a different agenda. Only the truth has the rightful agenda. And when you have writers like Edmond Paris, like Avro Manhattan, like P. D. Stewart, who are telling you about these different sources, they all come back to the same quotations and you see the resemblance. And they, they are all in agreement. And there you learn, as we've just seen, that it says that the National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim. There's also another very important, um, very important uh, quote from uh, Franz von Papen, who was the uh, vice-chancellor behind Hitler, and he was chancellor of Germany not before Hitler, but before that. So, uh, the, the last but one chancellor of the Weimar Republic before Hitler came to power in 1933. He is a Knight of Malta, he is Jesuit trained, he probably even was a high-level Jesuit, uh, and he makes a wonderful, interesting statement that when we come across that, um, I cannot help but do any uh, a few minutes of comment on that. Anyway, let's uh, continue, see how this works out here. This aim, uh, we are just talking about what aim, the National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim, so National Socialist Commandments, this aim was the New Middle Ages, means <laughs> a return to the time before the Reformation, a return to the Dark Ages. It's called Middle Ages, but it actually means Dark Ages. This aim was the quote-unquote New Middle Ages Hitler promised Europe. The similarity is obvious between the passionate anti-liberalism of this Jesuit from Munich and the equal fanaticism expressed during the act of consecration of the NNC in the Basilica of Montmartre. During the occupation, the R.P. Merklin wrote, quote, These days, liberty no longer seems to merit any esteem. Unquote. Quotations like such as these could be multiplied by the thousand. Is not this hatred of liberty under all its forms the character itself of the Roman master? It's easy also to understand how the Catholic doctrine and the Nazi doctrine could harmonize so well. The one who ably demonstrated this accord, the Jesuit Michael Schmaus, 
was called by Lacroix ten years after the war the great theologian of Munich, and nobody will be surprised to learn that he was made a prince of the church by Antichrist Pope Pius XII. Under the circumstances, what becomes of the terrible encyclical letter mit brennender Sorge, with burning concern, from Antichrist Pope Pius XI, which was supposed to condemn Nazism? <laughs> no casuist has ever tried to tell us. <laughs> Naturally! The great theologian Michael Schmaus had many rivals, according to a German author who sees in the Catholic Conservatives Erbgut, which is the Catholic Conservative uh, uh, Erbgut that is um, uh, yeah, uh, the genes, in the genes of the Catholic Conservatives, the strangest book ever published by the German Catholic publications. Quote, this anthology, which brings together texts from the main Catholic theorists of Germany, from Doris to Vogelsang, makes us believe that National Socialism was born out of Catholic ideas. <laughs> Isn't this interesting to read, dear viewer? This again, in other words, says what we have already learned a little bit higher in the text. This anthology, which brings together text from the main Catholic theorists of Germany, from Goris to Vogelsang makes us believe that National Socialism was born out of Catholic ideas. That's in other words saying the same thing as the National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim, isn't it? You have to pay attention to the sophistry, to the casistry. You have to see that they are saying the same thing over and over and over again with different words, but the meaning does not change. Semperiadem, always the same. The meaning is always the same. The words are different, but they say the same. When writing this, the author certainly didn't realize he was describing it so perfectly. Another well-informed person... Ah, oh, now it comes. <laughs> Another well-informed person, the mainstring of the pact between the Holy See and Berlin, and the Pope's secret chamberlain, Franz von Papen, was even more explicit. Now... You have to really pay attention. I am going to break this sentence down to a way that you will, I hope, sit there with your jaws being dropped to the ground, sitting before, in front of your screen and listening to my explanation of this. Maybe you come to it by yourself, I don't know. Franz von Papen said, and this is a quote that he did, not only, but he did for sure when he was at the Nuremberg trials, where he was sentenced for a few years, and uh, then afterwards he was restored as papal chamberlain by Pope Pius XII, by the way. His quote, as I put here in green, is so important. It reads, The Third Reich is the first world power, which not only acknowledges, but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. Unquote. Now, you say, well, Jörg, what's so important about the sentence you just read? This anthology, which brings together text from the Catholic theorists of Germany, makes us believe that National Socialism was born out of Catholic ideas. You read to us before that the National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim. Now you read from von Papen, the Third Reich is the first world power which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. So where's the difference? You just said it, Jörg. They are saying the same thing over and over and over with casuistry and sophistry, semperiarem, saying the same things using different words. No. This is even deeper. This is so deep I only fell, fell about it, I think, yesterday, or the day before, when I was reading with... Ah, um, oh no, it, it was in the, uh, in the Bible study. In our Bible study last Sabbath, so today is the Tuesday, the 20, uh, one, Monday the 26th, so that was on the 24th of, uh, of February, I did my Bible study with Tom Fress and uh, with Brett Norman. And uh, during that Bible study, I had something that I really wanted to tell Tom. And um, 
I did so, and we also read this one, and all of a sudden, it came to me, it, w it was, and I'm not exaggerating, it really felt like it was a revelation. The Holy Spirit all of a sudden opened my eyes and I could see what really was written there. Let's read it again. The Third Reich is the first world power, which not only acknowledges, but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. Now, why is this so relevant? Why is this so special? And by the way, before I do so, I'm going to look for a picture from, from Papen. And um, then we can look at him, because I have pictures of him here. Uh, no, that is not where he is restored. Um, this is a picture from von Papen, with the Maltese cross, as you can see, here and here and here. He has all kinds of emblems and symbols uh, telling his allegiance. Yeah, come to the point. Yeah, I will. The Third Reich is the first world power which not only acknowledges but puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. He could have said, listen closely, the Third Reich is a power which not only acknowledges but point, 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 point. The Third Reich is a nation. The Third Reich is a world power. The Third Reich not only acknowledges but puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. He could have said all that, but what does he say? He speaks of the first world power. He does not even speak of a world power. He could have said the Third Reich is a world power which not only point 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 etc etc. No 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 no. He says the Third Reich is the first world power. Now. Germany in the First World War was quite successful. And when they were defeated in 1918, no Allied soldier set foot on German ground. Yeah? The German soil was quote unquote undefiled of Allied soldiers. They surrendered before that even happened. Germany then went into, let's say, this period of quote-unquote democracy during the Weimar Republic and out of that came Roman Catholic sponsored and controlled Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler then put into practices the policies of the Roman Catholic Church as we have learned already. Okay? And then what happened at the end of World War II? Compared to World War I, Germany was completely crushed. It was completely obliterated. It was devastated. It was absolutely destroyed. Nothing was over anymore. It cost millions and millions and millions and billions to get that country up again. It was completely destroyed. They needed it to get up again because Germany had to fulfill a role in the coming Europe, in the European Union as we have today, which for me is nothing else but the, uh, how do you say that, uh, Holy uh, Roman Empire uh, of, um, of, you, uh, of Europe today. I think I have a picture here where it says that, uh, I just have to see yeah, this is also a nice one, eh? Angela Merkel, defiler of Europe. But that's not the picture. Uh, this is the one I was looking for. Huh? Catholic European Union. Watch out for a Catholic European Union. And here you have this uh, building of the Parliament in Strasbourg that is built after the design of the Tower of Babel. But what's my point? If you didn't get it right now, I'm going to tell you. Van Papen says that the Third Reich is the first world power to put into practice the high principles of the papacy. And Germany, after the Second World War, got crushed beyond recognition. Now, after the Second World War, 
there were two world powers in the world. On the one hand, you had, let's say on the left hand, you had the Communists, you had the Soviet Union, run by Stalin and then some other people after him until Gorbachev brought it down in the 1980s, end of the 1980s. And on the other hand, you have the United States of America. And those two world powers did, according to the Jesuit oath, play a little game. We call it the Cold War. They call it just Jesuitical theater. Okay? Now, at the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, the Soviet Union fell and communism was shattered all over the place. The Soviet Union fell, Poland fell, Hungary fell, Romania fell, Albania fell, Czechoslovakia fell, Yugoslavia fell, all these countries in, the Euro in, in, in Europe that have been communist controlled after World War II fell into the obliteration of communism. All of a sudden communism was quote unquote gone. It only went underground, but that's another point. That's not the point that I want to aim to. What The point that I really want to make is and what was my revelation, my understanding last Saturday is that since the beginning of the 1990s you only have one world power left in this world. I mean, China is maybe a power but is not a world power. The United States of America has, I think, over 200 uh, military bases in, uh, in, in, in about 200 countries in this world. The United States of America are the quote-unquote policemen of this world. Of course they are, because they are, according to Revelation 13, the beast that comes out of the wilderness. They are the second beast. So, stay with me. In the 1930s and beginning of 1940s, during the World War, you had the Third Reich, the Nazi German Third Reich, as the first world power that put into practice the high principles of the papacy. When Germany was crushed after World War II, world powers arise, arose, that is the Soviet Union on the one hand and the United States of America on the other hand. At the end of the 1980s, also with the help of course of the quote-unquote Holy Alliance that you can read on in chapter 1 of uh, Rulers of Evil in Tapasosi's book, communism was brought down and that was what uh, Time magazine wrote in 1992. The conspiracy between Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II to bring via Poland the demise of communism. So one world power was done away with. No war needed this time. Huh? It was a quote-unquote political revolution. It was a quote-unquote regime change, but from the inside. Not much blood flu. There's certainly no war, no big war and no world war. Okay? One world power remained, the United States of America. And the United States of America is today, 2018, as we speak, the only left world power in the world. And America, more and more every day, puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. Why? Well, you can argue or you can just listen and understand. The United States of America is no protestant country anymore. Because otherwise, why did you invite the Antichrist in 2015 to speak for a joint before a joint session of Congress? Yeah? A protestant country would never do that. And it is said so in Revelation 13 where it says that the second beast started out as a lamb and it spake as a dragon. Okay, the dragon in the Bible is uh, equivalent with the devil, Satan. Yeah? So it came out Christ-like, like a lamb, but it spake as a dragon like a Satan, like a devil. Since the United States of America 
become more and more Catholic every day without people noticing. I mean, let's not argue. Of the nine judges on the Supreme Court of the United States of America, there is not one Protestant. There are about at least six, if not even seven Catholics at this moment. And at least two of them are members of Opus Dei. And I am not sitting here and pointing the finger, understand me correctly. I just want to wake you up to the fact, whether you like it or not, it's a fact that the United States of America is in the situation today as was Germany in the 1930s. And it is the remaining, it is the only world power. Now what do you think will happen when a war breaks out and the Roman Catholic Church wants to first and for all destroy their enemy what are so called protestants and liberals yeah don't forget the liberals because america is full of liberals and evangelicals and evangelicals and liberals are not ultramontane but the roman catholic church is ultramontane the roman catholic church is in the spirit of the Council of Trent and everything that does not adhere to that has to go. That was the policy of Adolf Hitler during his reign in Germany and that is the policy of the United States of America now and in the future. Because Donald Trump is Jesuit trained and Jesuit controlled, Obama was Jesuit controlled and all the other presidents are have their relations to the CFR that is a foundation of the Jesuits. I mean, just when you when you look into that, you, you, you understand. And what are the Jesuits? Well, the Jesuits are a military order. They are the military arm of the Roman Catholic Church. And they use the countries they control to do their bidding, to do their aim. And 70 years ago, dear brethren, it was Germany, and Germany got crushed for it afterwards. And that is gonna come to the United States of America. And Franz von Papen says this in this quote, the Third Reich is the first world power. If there is a first world power, there must be also a second. Otherwise you wouldn't even speak about a first. Franz von Papen was a high-level Knight of Malta. He was in the knowledge. He was what people call, quote-unquote, enlightened. Yeah? He knew what he was talking about. They make plans 50, 60, 70, 100, 150 years on beforehand, or even longer. That's how long the Vatican plans. When Franz von Papen spoke about, I'm going to put this picture up here again. When Franz von Papen spoke about that the Third Reich is the first world power, which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy, he knew that after that a second world power would come that does exactly the same thing and that will be shattered and destroyed just as Germany was after the Second World War. Now you can say, I drank a little bit too much cool aid, oh, Jörg sees a Jesuit under every stone, Oh, Jörg, no, that's not it. It's this and that, and that's all not true. The Jews rule the world, and the Roman Catholic Church does nothing, and blah, blah, blah. People, I don't care what you think. I tell you not what I think. I tell you what I make out of reading this book, and reading between the lines, and not only reading this book, but reading all the other books also. The books that I've read and the, that I'm reading right now. Right now I'm reading Code World Babylon. Yeah? I have um, I have received a fortnight ago the memoirs of Franz van Papen. The guy you see here in this picture, he wrote memoirs, 500 some pages. I'm gonna read that book, but it's German and it takes some time, but I'm gonna read it and I think there will be some very interesting revelation in there. I've read All Roads Lead to Rome. I've read Rulers of Evil. I read this book the secret history of the Jesuits. I read for the moment Code Word Babylon with Brett Norman. And what happens when you read these books, 
you learn and learn and learn and you surely learn to connect the dots and you have to learn to read between the lines when a person in the position that Franz von Papen was speaks about the first world power you just have to understand oh wait but then there's a second uh, who is the world power today I mean every little child knows that the United States of America is the only world power today because they don't see the Vatican behind that and they don't have the Bible where the Bible clearly says that there are two beasts okay that's in Revelation 13 but now oh now we go a little bit further in Revelation we go to Revelation 17 how many beasts are there? Oh, there's only one left and that is the city on seven hills uh, that's not Washington that's Rome and a woman rides that beast and that's the Roman Catholic Church riding the Vatican riding the beast of the Vatican the United States is the second beast where is that at that moment? it's gone it has gone the way of Germany after the Second World War and Franz von Papen tells us this right here the Third Reich is the first world power and the world power of today is the United States of America and Revelation 17 speaks of only the Vatican so this second world power which is the United States of America today is doomed and it is doomed not because I say it or I like it it is doomed because God's word confirms that and it is doomed because Franz von Papen says Germany was the first world power and the United States of America are the second and surely are the last think about that do I see this wrong? correct me biblically and historically but on the other hand when you start doing your own research I think that you will understand what I just read to you this little sentence of Franz von Papen says so much more than the just 20 words of what are in the sentence it says so much more the Third Reich, Franz von Papen says, is the first world power which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. The United States of America is Roman Catholic and people don't recognize it because they are too busy with other things. And the quote-unquote Protestants over there are all evangelicals. And evangelicals are what? And they are with a protestant church that is in bed with Rome like the Lutheran church to, through the joint declaration of justification of 1999 like the Methodists that signed the same paper in 2004 all the churches are gathered together in the, in the world council of churches that is a organization to bring all protestant churches back under the wings of Rome they are all evangelical and evangelical has nothing to do with speaking the gospel it has everything to do with speaking the words of the dragon going back to Rome come back to mama so I think I made my point I hope I made my point I hope you understood my point that I was making okay <coughs> get this picture up that we know that we are going to continue the reading here to this and that is the quote of Franz von Papen we are speaking here to this we will add the result of this putting into practice 25 million victims of the concentration camps the official figure issued by the United Nations organization now I don't trust the figures of the United Nations organization but I know from a lot of sources that all the victims together of the Second World War were at least 66 million yeah? at least 66 million we are speaking about soldiers we are speaking about women and children civilians 
we are speaking about civil men, civil women and civil children and soldiers fighting in the front and it was at least 66 million death and not one of those deaths was not wanted by the Vatican. Here the author says we find it necessary to add something especially for candid minds for those who cannot admit that the organized massacres were one of the papacy's high principles. Of course the scandal is diligently uh, maintained. Quote, Such barbarian deeds belong to the past. <laughs> That's what you say today, right? Uh, may I remind you what happened after 9-11 and uh, there came news out when the American soldiers fell into Iraq Iraq and uh, you had this uh, scandals of that prison Abu Ghraib or what the name was something like that and of course you have uh, Guantanamo Bay and all the other secret CIA and other secret uh, and intelligence organizational um, uh, secret hideouts all through the world secret prisons all through the world where there was done quote unquote enhanced interrogation which is nothing else but torture. Uh, you call it waterboarding, but that's the same thing that the Inquisition already did 500, 600, even 1000 years ago. I can, I can prove that. I'm not talking out of my ass here. I can prove that to you. Why? Because there are pictures of people who have been waterboarded, as we call it today, so many years ago in the Inquisition. I only have to see where that picture is. I mean, let's put it all up. Is it this this one? No, that's not it. But uh, le let's do this here a little bit bigger and you can see them for yourself. These are all pictures that I have on my computer um, just dealing with the Inquisition. Yeah. So, um, where is that waterboarding? Uh, here you have the wreck. Uh, when they are put on the rack and uh, things like these are done today also. I don't see this waterboarding picture. It's a famous picture. I often use it. Ah, uh, here. Waterboarding torture. Here it is. You know. You're blinded. You can't move. You're filled water into your mouth until you drown. That's what they call waterboarding. And this is a picture from the Inquisitional times. And this is still today. Uh, of course they call it differently, but what did I say to you earlier? Sophistry and casuistry giving the same things over and over a different name, but actually sempre adem. It remains the same. It's just different words. Yeah. Such barbarian deeds belong to the past? No. No. Nobody wants to see them today. So say some good apostles to the simple, while shrugging their shoulders before the non-Catholics for whom the fires of the Holy Inquisition are still burning. Yeah? Get it? I haven't read this on beforehand. I'm reading this the very first time with you together. So when I do a comment on something that is said there in the next sentence, I haven't read that sentence yet. Because you see, I am speaking and talking and sharing information and doing and speaking as the Holy Spirit leads me. By that I cannot read a sentence or two in advance. Yeah. But this is just what I told you. And here the author confirms. So say some good apostles to the simple while shrugging their shoulders before non-Catholics for whom the fires of the Holy Inquisition are still burning. They never cease to burn. So be it. Let us set aside the superabundant testimonies about the clerical ferocity of years gone by, uh, of years gone by to consider the 20th century. <coughs> I'm sorry. We will not recall 
either the exploits of men like Stepinac and Marcone in Croatia, you remember the NDH, nor Tiso in Slovakia, but will confine ourselves to examining to, examine, to, to examining the orthodoxy of certain high principles they put so well into practice. Are they really outdated today, these principles, disowned by an enlightened doctrine, officially rejected by the Holy See with other mistakes of a dark past? It's easy to find out. Let us, for example, open the Great Apologetics by the Abbé Jean Vieux-Jean, which can hardly be described as medieval as it is dated 1937. What do we read in the Great Apologetics by Abbé Jean Vieux-Jean? To accept the principle of the Inquisition, one only needs a Christian mentality, and this is what many Christians lack. The Church has no such timidity. I have a speech in this uh, paper, I don't know if I can find it, um, uh, I don't even know if that was on there because this this text is already, no, no this, this text is too old, uh, it's, it's not the latest version. Um, anyway, to accept the principle of the Inquisition one only needs a Christian mentality and this is what many Christians lack. The Church has no such timidity. One could not put it better. Is another proof, no less orthodox and modern necessary? Now, listen to the R.P. Janvier, a famous conference speaker at Notre Dame. Quote, By virtue of her indirect power of, over temporal matters, should not the Church, speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, have the right to expect Catholic states to oppress heretics even to the point of death uh, so as to suppress them? Here's my answer. I do advocate this even to the point of death, learning first of all on the practice then on the teaching of the Church itself, and I am convinced that no Catholic would say the opposite without erring gravely. We could not accuse this theologian of speaking in riddles. His speech is clear and concise. It would be impossible to say more with fewer words. Everything is there concerning the right the Church arrogates to herself to exterminate those whose beliefs do not correspond with hers. The teaching which compels her the practice which legitimates by tradition and even the call to the Christian states of which the Hitlerian crusade was such a perfect example. The following words, far from ambiguous, were not pronounced in the darkness of the Middle Ages either. Because you think when you read something of the Middle Ages, whoa, but today we are civilized, we don't do that anymore, as it said here on the top of the page. Such barbarian deeds belong to the past. No, no, no. The Church can condemn heretics to death for any rights they have are only through our tolerance, and these rights are apparent not real. The author of this quote was Jesuit General Franz Werns, a German who was General of the Society of Jesus between 1906 and 1915, and the fact that he was German as well gives even more weight to his declaration. Why? Well, think about, for example, Pope Benedict XVI, the German Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger, who has been 25 years the chief officer of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the new fancy title for the Holy Office of the Inquisition. During the 20th century also Cardinal Le Pissier, notorious prince of the Church, wrote, quote, If someone professes publicly to be an heretic or tries to pervert others, by his speech or example he cannot only be excommunicated, but also 
be killed. Unquote. Again. Let's see. And put this in a little more color that we can easier recognize this. Let's use this one. If someone professes publicly to be an heretic or tries to pervert others by his speech or example, he cannot only be excommunicated but also justly killed. So whether you speak as a protestant or you act as a protestant, you cannot only be excommunicated but you can also be justly killed. If that's not a characteristic appeal to murder, I might as well be changed into a pepper mill, as the late Cotelin said. Is the sovereign pontiff's contribution wanted as well? Here it is, from a modern pope whose liberalism was criticized by intransigent clerics, the Jesuit pope Leo XIII. Quote, Anathema! On the one who says, the Holy Spirit does not want us to kill the heretic. <laughs> really? Really? Anathema on the one who says, the Holy Spirit does not want us to kill the heretic? Wow. <laughs> wow. What higher authority could be invoked after this one apart from that of the Holy Spirit? Even though this may displease those who manipulate the smoke screen, reference to those who put out smoke signals during the choice of a pope, <laughs> the soothers of disquieted consciences, the papacy's high principles remain unchanged. Unchanged the high principles remain and, amongst other things, the extermination for the faith is as valid and canonical today as it was in the past. A conclusion most enlightening to use a word dear to mystics when we consider what happened in Europe between 1939 and 1945. M. Frederick Hoffert wrote Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler and most members of the party's old guard were Catholics. It was not by accident that, because of its chief's religion, the National Socialist government was the most Catholic Germany ever had. This kinship between National Socialism and Catholicism is most striking if we study closely the propaganda methods and the interior organization of the party. On that subject, nothing is more instructive than Joseph Goebbels' work. He had been brought up in a Jesuit college and was a seminarist before devoting himself to literature and politics. Every page, every line of his writings recall the teaching of his masters, the Jesuits. So he stressed obedience, the contempt for truth, quote, some lies are as useful as bread, he proclaimed by virtue of a moral relativism extracted from Ignatius Loyola's writings of the Constitutions and the Spiritual Exercises. Hitler did not award the palm of Jesuitism to his chief of propaganda, though to the Gestapo's chief, as he told his favorites, I can see Himmler as our Ignatius of Loyola." Unquote. So, let me just check a little bit how far we are. Uh, we have almost come to an hour, so I would prefer to read this next part in the next reading. Yeah, we're gonna stop right here. Uh, you know, it is, it is not about reading many pages, so we have three and a half pages to go for the next time. But I think the comments that I made today were absolutely important to be understood. And especially, uh, so let me just highlight this here, um, especially the quote 
that we read from um, Franz von Papen. Yeah. Continue here. Um, I think this is absolutely something that you have to study maybe again. I mean, you can get the book free on the internet. The PDF is freely available. Available. You can read it for yourselves. You can pause the video. You can put it on pause. You can read it over and over and over again. And tell me if you understand anything else but that von Papen said that the Third Reich, the Nazi German Reich, is the first world power. And there was no other world power at that time. But, of course, after World War II, America arose as the world power. England was done. America arose and the Soviet Union was the other. So they clashed these two in the theater of the quote-unquote Cold War, which we all believed to be true at the time, and for them it was just a big joke. Then they brought down, via Poland, communism, and the only world power is over is the United States of America, that is the second one. And now, maybe you read the sentence like this. The United States of America is the second world power which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. And when you know what happened to Germany that did that before, that same doom is laying in wait for the United States of America. And with this, I've come to my conclusion. Read this book for yourself, especially when you doubt anything that I say here is true. Or you say, oh, Jörg, no, that's not that way, that's that way and that way. Well, then prove me with other writings, prove me with other books. But please don't refer to these mainstream alternative media guys like Alex Jones and, 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 and all these idiots out there. I mean, I, I don't care. They are all on the payroll for the Jesuits, you know. They never tell you the truth. Yeah, here and there, they, they lift a little bit, but they never... They lift the veil a little bit, but they never take it away. And you have to take the veil away or you have to see behind the veil, behind the curtain. You have to see what's behind the door, to use that expression of that series from Bill Hughes. You have to, to see what's behind the door to see the puppet master. Otherwise you will always just see the puppets. And then you are doomed to repeat history. History repeats itself. Yeah, because we are indoctrinated with false history. We over here in Europe as much as you over there in the United States of America. We over here in Europe probably even more, because we have a history of war of 2,000 years. Your country doesn't even exist that long. Yeah? We have a rich history in this, and we have been indoctrinated with lies all and all over. Everybody knows, yeah, the victor writes history. That's right, but who is the victor up to now, everywhere? I mean, in the end, of course, it's Jesus Christ who wins. Yeah? Christ always wins. Christ wins in the end, that, that's not the point. But here in this Antichrist system for the moment, these wars, who is the winner at the end? The Roman Catholic Church, because that's what the Jesuits swear, to do everything that the Church gains in advantage. The end justifies the means, that in the end the Church is the winner, the Church is the gainer. So the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, which is not Christian, writes our history books since hundreds of years. From those you do not get the knowledge that you need to have to understand and to be prepared. And by prepared I don't mean go out there buy guns and go out there buy ammunition, but I mean put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 6 verses 10 through 18. Read that for yourself. Until next time, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off and this reading of the secret history of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris is now done. God bless you and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life 
where the Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and, and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.